Buenas noches, buenas tardes a todos. Hello, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Terrestrial University, who was launched one year ago. We had at that time a three-day three exhibition called Critical Sword with Bono Latour, Donna Hathaway, for example, and different artists. It is wonderful to have you here with us. And I would like to welcome Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui. She's here with us. Silvia is one of the main intellectuals of Latin America. She speaks Aymara. And she is professor of sociology. She combines the Andean wisdom, the languages with different practices and she's also a historian, she's also a feminist and a teacher. She writes, for example, she fights, for example, for the decriminalization of the coca plant. A coca plant is a sacred plant in the culture of the Andean region. She's been working on oral history and also the sociology of the image. The hair work plays a very important role in the understanding of the dialectic of the colonization in order to achieve a better understanding of history. Thank you very much for being with us. It's wonderful also to welcome Mike, Mike. She is a professor of theory and cultural methods in the University of Constance, Germany. She works in research in the archive of new history, for example, and the links between Latin America and Europe, and also the work in different aspects of life in Latin America, in Rio del Plata, for example, and also she works about birth and death. She was co-producer for the um, e-learning program for the for the police called to transmit death messages with responsibility. Wonderful to have you here. And also we have the support of two very important person, of two interpreters, Camilo and Rafa. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for supporting us with language translation. And also Sonia, because she is able to provide a wonderful services of simultaneous translation from Spanish into English. My name is Lena. I work with the ZKM. My Spanish is not very good. Maybe you can hear that I prefer to speak Portuguese, Portuñol. I will try to stay in Spanish, but anyway, I will do my best because I speak Portuguese from Brazil, actually. So. Now I come to an end and I give the floor to Kerstin. Thank you very much, Lena, for the, your introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is wonderful to be here with you too, together with Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui in this virtual space. It is a division, but at the same time, it brings us together. It is an honor for me to have the opportunity to talk with her about different topics. We're talking about the um, concept of the ex exhibition Critical Zones. You have been talking about the social crisis and the environmental crisis and the key come from the perspective on the Andean region. We are talking about Critical Zones. We know Latour has transferred this term to the humanity. And I think that's a perfect starting point when we want to talk about vulnerable zones in earth and water that we, where we live. And of course, I have to talk about the temporal dimension. When we talk about critical zones, I think that it's an archipel of 
different spaces which are connected and there are they determine the way we th think and the way we live. De la conquista de México. This year we are celebrating the fourth five, five the fifth centenary of the conquest of Mexico, this catastrophe of the destruction of Kinoskitlan, for example, was the start of the colonization. There was a big abuse of men, women, and lands, and it's also the start of the exploitation of many, many people for the for wealth, for in order to achieve uh, something positive for Europe. Now we see there was an encounter of the old and the new world. What are we talking about? Are we, are we talking about guilt, for example? Are we talking about uh, of a starting point? We have to think about what do we live from? What do we live from in the different spaces in our planet? We are trying to learn something from the survivors now and now we come to realize that the colonization of the air also affects us in the north, in the global north. Now we see that the situation is very difficult. We see the situation of the extraterrestrial, of the absentee law land, something that we like so much. Actually, it avoids our living in our regions. Many moments in the history, it would have been easier to change direction more than nowadays. One of these moments was a moment in 1650. There was an opportunity offered by Waman Poma de Ayala. I would like to show you something. I would like to show you some pictures. Some, and I would like to talk to you about these pictures with you and with Celia Rivera. Uh, Waman Puma, para los que no lo conocen, Waman Puma, for the one who do not know him, he is an con toda claridad y lleno de dolor. author in, from the Andean region. He wrote a very long letter, more than 1,000 pages, and different pictures, and it was written to the King Felipe III of Spain. He talked about the perspective of many exploited Indians or killed Indians. He demanded the stop or the end of those abuses. He proposed a new kind of history, a new way of understanding the present from the perspective of the conquest and in a place where everybody, all the peoples in the world can live together. Not only the European peoples are, live, are able to live, but all the peoples in the world. But mainly, he said, that it's important to give back restitution. It's very important. He demanded from the king to pay the debts, all the money that's also the food that all the um, officials ate, but they didn't pay at all for them. There was also a lot of crimes committed and they have to be punished. All the priests and the children violators have to go to to jail and of course they have to give back all the lands taken away from the Indian. That would be restitution. That would be something that could should be achieved. The living of the people before before we don't achieve a real equality, we cannot talk of a global agreement for the whole world. Basically that's the that's the main content of this letter of Guaman. Silvia, for many years, you've been talking about new ways of thinking, new ways of acting, new ways of living in the world. And I am sure you have read this text from many places in the country. These demands presented by Guaman, is this a lost opportunity in the past or can we still call it a valid demand? In It, it, it can be fulfilled or not? I have said that a couple of times, and I wrote it in my book 
sociology of the imaging, the rhetoric of Guamampola was very clear, the discourse was very clear in order to convince Spain to give restitution that there is a lot of injustice in the world. And he created a fictive dialogue with the King of Spain in order to explain, to express his feelings. He was complaining, but he was not only complaining with the voice of the defeated, he was also very angry. He wanted to propose something. He wanted to give a possible solution because he was talking also talking about the bad government, for example. He wants to present a change of this bad government, of this bad governance. And this should be based in the Inca history, in the pre-Hispanic history. The world was an Andean, Andean world, Christianized. The Andean world was even more Christian than, than many other places due to the history of San Bartolome, for example, and San Thomas. He represented this deity Tunuka, a pre-Hispanic deity. And what he was to, trying to achieve was to put together the Indian history, as Kirsten said before, to create a new world history of the known world. And to link it together with the empire created by the kings of Spain. He wrote that letter to King Felipe III. And at that time, many things had happened. There was some reforms of this vice royalty. The situation was very, very critical. There was a very neg negative demographic development, for example. People were thrown away from their lands. And I think this letter is also very valid today. We discovered Wamampoma together with the Amaran peoples when we were doing a workshop about Andean history. And everybody was aware that what was described by, by Wamampoma, all this violence of these cultural practices at that time, they were valid at that time, and they were practices. And due to this work of oral history we developed, we could see that that happened every day. It was taken many, many videos. There were many things that we thought it wouldn't happen anymore, actually still happen. And all, was, all this was described by Roman Pola. So I have to say, there's a lot of validity today in the topics that Waman Poma was talking about. And then the works of René Andomo or Mercedes López Barán was also studied and we saw that there was a search, there was a there were some places of, of the country which was not colonized, and they were talking about how the, the space in the different pictures, for example, was uh, organized. There were um, the centralized um, idea of some of the bodies, for example, there was the left and also the right, but they didn't recognize that in all this written text and also in the pictures, there is a clear fight, the, fear, the clear fight of two realities, of two visions. And we see the situation, of course, is colonized. Guaman Poma is against the consume of the coca leaf he says that it's some kind of, um, of drunken practice, some kind of addiction. 
And the translator of these letters knew also very well all these practices by the Indians, which were actually prohibited. But he didn't talk about the sacred statue of the coca leaf. So he saw there was a degradation of the consume of coca because actually these Spaniards at the beginnings were aware about the rituals created about the coca leaf that actually was very important for their religion. So they decided, I think due to pragmatic reasons, they wanted to include coca in the salary of the miners, for example. In that way, everybody was consuming coca and maybe they were consuming it too much before the time was which was described by Baman Poma where everything everything was legalized he saw that there was a lot of degradation of this consume but he didn't talk at all about the old practices for example in the pre-Hispanic era he didn't talk at all about coca for example and the coca consume there are many colonized elements in his thinking. And he was trying to achieve some kind of restoration of the old hierarchies. He wasn't talking about equality. He, his conception of the world was completely different. He wanted to have the way, the world, the older way around, the lower people, would control the world and these caciques, for example, they are actually very degraded. The situation is very bad there. So actually there is a new way of thinking about colonization. And we have to compare the abuse which Spaniards carried out, which uh, with the one uh, which was carried out by mestizos. Of course, they wanted to climb the social ladder. And there were mestizos who would migrate to the city in order to differentiate themselves from their peers, and they were not able to do this through their uh, skin color. So some thought the only way to distinguish themselves was to treat their peers badly. So this abuse is due to having felt this sub subordination, this humiliation by the Spaniards. He was prostrating himself before the king, before somebody who is at the very top of hierarchy. And all this shows um, um, concrete mentality. But at the same time, he works with different allegories. Sometimes these allegories are a comparison between two images, which are separated by many, many pages in his text. For instance, he talks about the execution of Atahualpa in 1533 as a beheading. And the similar image, the, the image is very similar to the beheading of Pacamaro I, the, the first, in Vilcabamba. Only the, the clothes were different. So there is one thing many historians think um, is a mistake. 
And it's this allegory of this beheading, which happened in 1533. And, well, it took, took place with a cudgel that was an instrument uh, for torture. Um, but I believe it's just an allegory. It wasn't meant to be a um, faithful image, but just an allegory. And throughout this test, text, there's, um, there are many signs that he was referring to this colonial symbol of beheading, which become clear in, in these pictures. He also shows uh, the weaver as uh, the one at the top, somebody who is very happy looking, meeting, sorry. And a bit later, with the same position, the same gesture, with the same picture composition, uh, she's doing the same thing, but under the scrutiny of a priest who is hurting her, is hitting her. And this shows that a job which used to be full of creativity and joy became something painful. So I believe there are many very beautiful elements in this text, especially if we compare these pictures. And I could also mention the comparison of both calendars. In the pre-Hispanic part, he shows a calendar with a sacrifice in January, with a fasting in February, we have a sacrifice with gold, silver, and then in March, there is a black flame, and so on. There is a sacrifice for each month. In November, and they take the death out of their tombs, and they celebrate. So I'm thankful for these this image, because it shows this astonishment uh, with regards to the Spaniards. And uh, at the end of the book, there is a calendar showing what um, happened at the time of Waman Puma, what the communities used to practice. But I find it very important that he points out that it's only thanks to the work of Indians that Spaniards can eat. And also the ancient philosophers used to need the work of others in order to eat. And he gave an example of an astrologist, somebody who knows a lot about seasons, about stars, about uh, different winds, when is the right time to soar the plants. And besides this Indian, who is the survivor of this beheading uh, process, we have the shock of um, whole conquista. So we have this critic about the, the meeting with Cambia, about exchanging gold for food. 
que está arrodillado frente al indio. But what matters is that this character who is kneeling next to a sitting Inca with a human appearance. What does it imply that he eats gold? If we compare this with um, what happens in February in the pre-Hispanic calendar, we can see the same plate as in this other picture with which it's being offered to the Spaniard. So I believe it is this difference, um, and I believe this is the um, contribution of my work. I believe that oral tradition is very important in order to understand these phenomena. The fact is that people have a clear vision of the um, calendaric character of gold. Um, people usually wear gold just for carnival, for certain celebrations, but it's not something you would wear every day, and not everybody's looking for gold the whole time. So this is why they must have interpreted that Spaniards must eat gold because otherwise they wouldn't want to have gold the whole time. So thanks to this allegory, we are able to rescue this critical dimension. Uh, opposing the world Spaniards brought to us, another world in which the true hierarchies uh, should be respected, in which authority can be exercised without corruption, and this must take place with spatial segregations. Segregation. This is Spaniards should stay in the cities and so on, and indigenous people should stay in their areas. And each of them should be ruled by their own authority. And I believe this is an utopy which is possible. This is something which would allow us to rethink some elements of the past as something new, but reinterpreting the ways of living together we had in the past. They enabled welfare, they enable respect for each other, work, sharing obligations, not just uh, material needs or consumption, but also as a sacred activity, which goes along a whole lot of rituals. So this possibility of making something sacred and joyful out of work is something which is inside this utopia. Do you have more questions? I would like to have a look again at this picture. And I was quite impressed by the way Waman Puma diagnosed that uh, the Spaniard is uh, ill, must have problems with their ears and 
and intelligence because they don't even eat properly. And this picture doesn't express hate or even the, the need for revenge. I think it's rather a picture of somebody who resists learning from others. I think it's another lost opportunity, what we see in this image. The occasion of sharing a table and food and enjoying an encounter between strangers. In your book, a Cheshire world is possible. You said that this image shows the most pure legacy of colonization. Could you maybe comment a bit on this? In this text we see with this drawing, they always talk about the fact that they are not humans because they eat gold. Even the horses, for example, they eat silver, sacred silver. They stay awake the whole all night long, talking to the papers, and they have very strange faces. They have beards, they have wool on their faces, and their penises are completely strange and crooked, like the swords. But the word, the word, the talking of the Spaniards are a clear sign that they are no human. Actually, what they want, what they talk about is a clear sign that they are not human. And that reinforces the auto definition as extraterrestrial, away from this world. And of course, it goes vice versa. And that's the right why there were so much violence. The other person is not human. You can kill him. It is not a crime to kill the other because he's not human. And also the right to kill, to murder the other is uh, considered stronger from the Spanish side because they have a lot of possibilities to kill the other. They have the power, the political power to kill the Indians. Because actually, the reaction of the Indians were also only rebellions. And we can see it constantly in Qatari, for example, in all this Qataristic movement in the 18th century. Guaman Poma predicted that there would be rebellions. And what people were doing was to escape. They left the towns, for example, so women were responsible of the towns and they were raped, for example, and they gave there to mestizos, to half-breed, and actually that means a lot of social degradation. He doesn't have a very good opinion of the black people. He thinks they are the allies of the Spaniards. Black people also violated Indians by the orders of the Spain, of the Spaniards. But even among the Indians, for example, the Chinchain, I am from Cosa Suyo, the, the Consa Suyo were considered by other tribes as very wealthy, very fat, very lazy. And none of the analysis talks does not talk about any uh, about uh, another other element. It's the relationship between the highlands and the lowlands. There is a wonderful drawing by a Inca going to the lower lands in order to establish any relationship with the inhabitants of there. He changed his form as an a jaguar, and you can see that he's a jaguar in order to talk to others. Of course, for that, he has to eat some sacred plants like yajé or coca. 
We know, for example, that the chamans they transform their sense only after consuming yaje, for example. He says that, and he comes together with a chuncho woman, and they have a son, and actually that's the pro pro product of two societies. That's the first mestizo, half the half breed. And I think that story relates a lot with the situation we see nowadays by the government of Evo Morales against indigenous peoples. For example, Evo Morales invited the coca growers to, to go to the Indian peoples and achieve that they fell in love, that they fall in love with him, with them. And then in that way, they are trying to change things. But actually, it's very strange, this relationship with somebody from another society, from another world. And now we see nowadays that we have, we have a bad government, even today. All these metaphors, all these allegories, show clearly that we have a clear colonization mentality in today. When Bruno Latour talked about critical zones, he said that we are not aware where we are, but what we are, what we need. We have to have a cartography, a map of all the relationship between the different places in the world, because they depend on each other. Y me parece que uh, esta imagen... This picture, this drawing can be interpreted as uh, this cartography, these critical zones. It shows perfectly. That's a kind of a map of these critical zones, those relationships. Because actually, he doesn't copy the patterns of the European topography. Here we see the relationships you are talking about and allegories and allegoric semiotic. And here we can see clearly that Spain, Castilla, in the bottom, is located under Potosí, below Potosí, below the richest silver mine of all the colonies. That's a map of the allegories of the economies which depend on each other and also the risk. Because basically, Castilla depends from the umbilical cord of the colonies. It's a kind of radi radiography of the mountain. On one hand, everybody thinks that Castilla is very powerful, but actually Castilla is not powerful because he said Castilla is Castilla, the Pope is the Pope, thanks to this mine. Maybe that's a warning for Felipe III, the third, but also it could be a map the model to show this topography, he shows clearly on what, what is the basis of the living, of the livelihood of the European. It is similar to the first map where Castilla is below the Indias and then also the Indias below Castilla. And he says clearly that the Indias, the Indias, the Indias lands are closer to the sun. And that's the reason why they are above Castilla. The Spaniards try to occupy, they are occupacha, they are in alapacha, they are closer to the light, closer to the sun. And that's basically the image they wanted to present, they wanted to turn the world around. Actually, the, the world around, on the other way around, is that Castilla is above the Indian. 
Es Land. también un trabajo muy subversivo con las palabras, ¿no? It's also very subversive with words. He uses a lot of terminology, Spanish terminology, and gives them new meanings. For example, the etymology of las Indians, the Indias, Indias, that means they are closer to the sun in the south. And in that way, he can present a lot of new ideas. He can use the Spanish language, he, something that the Spaniards can understand, but he gives that another meaning, different meaning, the not normal meaning. And those are very useful. We have to think about it because we have to think also about the language, this journey between languages. In the syntax of Spain, you can see there is a lot of intervention with the syntaxes of the Aymara. There are many anthems, songs, very long in Aymara or in Quechua, and there is a message where Tupac Amaru II has been killed in 1572. The Indians are crying below him, and they are crying in Quechua. They cried out, I, Inca, Rey, you are innocent, you've been killed. We are orphans. Esos fragmentos, ¿no? El, el destinatario no es el rey. Es muy posible que uno... The Adresi is actually not the king. Guaman Poma wanted to show this to everybody in, in the country. We didn't know what had happened with the book until it was discovered in 1905 in this uh, Copenhagen library. Aunque sea un autor colonizado, como has dicho, Silvia. Um, Even though it was, as you said, Silvia, a colonized author, I believe he nevertheless succeeds in communicating secret grammars and some understandings he doesn't reveal to us through everything we are not able to read or understand because of our central perspective, the way in which we look at images, which is not with, a, with the Andean logic. And we have seen these changes completely the perspective. And there are concepts uh, which and meanings which have not been colonized, right? Well, this is one of the main uh, inspirations for my Cheche concept. Because we have this juxtaposition of colonized and non-colonized elements. Even within the same sentence, we can see this fight between two visions. For instance, when he speaks about the transformation of the Inca, the um, Yahweh, they say uh, the coca plant is something which is not food, something which is a vice. And then in the following paragraph, he says, uh, that's a vice that is useless. I mean, there's the whole time a juxtaposition, which is not a fusion. And this is Cheche. And I think this has a decolonizing potential recognizing this and also in our time if we if we conceived 
indigenous and Spanish features as something which is equal, this is what would allow uh, decolonization. Yes, I believe this is one of the most difficult concepts in order to understand the European point of view. Utopias are always conceived as something harmonious by Europeans and as having something of a um, reconciliation. And this means nothing else than the concept of European defeating uh, everybody else's concept. And I believe this is the um, philosophical and political disease Europeans have. And we see this in the um, difficulty uh, in order to interpret what Roman wanted to tell the king. Well, I think the whole philosophy of Aristotle was oriented to one and an identity which doesn't define itself by A or B cannot be anything, but we see it is possible to be A and B at the same time without having a fusion um, and becoming a C thing. In the Indian culture, we are used to living with contradiction the whole time. We have some popular songs with these topics, lots of things we say in our everyday language, which reveal we feel very at ease with contradiction. And we believe this shows that the ancestry tradition can never be, be made disappear. In European languages, there is also a field in which contradictions coexist. This is called oxymoron. But this is something we almost only use in poetry not in politics, in economics, or in our social life. But we would be able to translate it from poetry to politics. Well, yes, oxymoron is also used at social sciences, especially in the United States. But I still think that Contradiction is something which is uh, uncomfortable. It's not so easy to, to be accepted. It's very uncertain. It's unstable, unforeseeable. So it doesn't contribute to make you feel at ease. Whereas Andeans are used to live uh, in contradiction for centuries. We have been living in contradiction with the Europeans and we're still here. This is because there is a very powerful force. In this ability for contradiction we have in the Andean culture, traditions, uh, language, Rights. So this is very pertinent for the topic of today. In your latest book, A Cheche World is Possible, you propose uh, communities which are ruled by an ethos and an episteme, a Cheche episteme, with um, Mama Pacha, with Mother Earth. And you also speak about the politics of the earth. What 
does this mean? Well, this is a bit the utopia of the book. And this translates into um, very important thing of the Amara language. We do not have just three grammar persons for singular and plural, like me, you, him, her. We have a fourth person, Iwasha. It is a singular person, but it means we. This is an enunciational I or me. This is when we do not use the, the plural form of the first person, which would be Nanaka, but we want to enunciate it. We have Nanaka, Kiwasa, and Kiwasanaka. And this offers precisely this possibility of having this community world being part of it with these um, voluntary communities which are anarchist and these communities which work the land, the rituals, offer an advantage in comparison to other utopias. And this is that it's a concrete utopia. And this implies we need to decide what are we going to eat, how are we going to eat, if we are going to do something or not. And it is also a classless society. This is a utopia which we can practice without having to wait for the whole world to change. It's based on doing what you believe you have to do. So you get there. And this is the link to activism. The rhythm and the ritual, um, do they take important roles um, in this utopia that you just said? Of course. And I was discussing this with Bruno Latour about the thousand cases of Gaia organized by Eduardo Ribeiro, I think, de Castro. And he said that non-humans can, they have science and they can speak. But he said it's not possible to communicate through rituals. But then I had to say that there is no other possible language in order to establish a relation. You need to establish some way of exchange. I think the indigenous culture values a lot symbolic things. How, how can you value rain enough? That's something huge. So it needs symbolism, it needs corporal sacrifices. I'm convinced that ritual is something essential and it translates um, to this importance of celebrations. It is very important to celebrate we are alive. And this is important for new young communities too. Is celebrating a way of symbiosis? Yes, of course. As long as you don't celebrate just for tourists, as long as you are not in disguise. And I say this because indigenous dances are something you cannot join and leave whenever you want. You, you need to dance for kilometers. I remember I 
I wanted to, to stop. I, I, my hip was hurting, but still I could feel this energy and it helped me stay until the end. And I speak a lot about the energetic potential of rituals. It gets transmitted as like electricity. It's a way of transmitting wishes. You know, there's some dramatism. You prepare the table, you pray every of the objects, and you have some rituals with coca plant, and you, you burn it. Uh, sometimes there's some issues with burning it. Then uh, you read out the ashes, you bury the ashes. So it's a whole cycle. And in the end, you, you go out of this feeling like you let go of some weight, some load. And in the future, even if technology uh, continues progressing, I'm convinced that a ritual is going to be fundamental. Um, Kirsten, um, como educadora, tú tienes un comentario final. As a teacher, maybe you can say something at the end. You can make a call at the end, a final call for us. Silvia or me? First of all, you, Kirsten, and then Silvia, maybe. I am very happy to be have been able to talk to you, Silvia. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. What I wanted to say is when I started reading Waman Puma and your interpretations of it, I started to understand that my place is here right now. And I have to start from here, from the south of Germany, in my little town. I have to start eating well and celebrating and having parties. And I can create some kind of resistance against this global economy and all that in order to find the possibilities to recognize the chances I have to live together and live in the earth we are living now. Yeah, that's completely right. The end, I also learned that Waman Poma is a very rich source of the art of asking the right questions. It is very important to try to find the right answers who are valid forever. And we're trying to find the answers in the universities, in books, and all these kind of recipes for everything. So, and I think that's not the right way of finding the answers. You are completely right. Thank you very much for that. I was very surprised at the end. I am a cucurruna, a very local person, a very person who has no aspiration to be read out, read everywhere in the world. And we see now there is a lot of crisis of identity, and we think it is important to overcome these essentialist visions because that creates funda fundamentalism movements. And I think it is a very big incentive to have this new idea of the Cheche, and then come this idea, idea comes together with many crises we see in the world. There are a lot of migrants from Latin America, for example, in Germany, Germ Latin Americans who are living there and then try to go back to the roots thank, uh, thanks to the clash they experience with the European world. We see very, very internal idea from a language nobody knows can create a lot of things in order to create some kind of activism in other parts of the world. 
I am very happy. I am very happy with that. And this dialogue has been one of the many, many processes I have experienced with people that have been had read my book in many other languages, in many other countries. And I like that very much. I would like to share with you an article who was written by a friend of mine from Colombia. That's the only review. My book has been read everywhere, everywhere, and there's the third edition in Argentina, for example, but there is not one single review of this book, only one. If you allow me, I can send it to you. Well, let me look for the file. You can send it to me afterwards if you prefer to. Okay, that's better. Good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia. Thank you very much, Christian. Thanks a lot for your ideas, for your observations, for your contribution. It's also a wonderful motivation for me. I'm talking Portuguese again. Motivation, claro, correcto. Right, motivation. It's the right way to say it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for everybody, to everybody. Thank you very much to Camilo. Thank you very much for Javier, because you did a wonderful job. And also, Sonia, thank you very much for helping us finding great interpreters. Thank you very much, Peter and Moritz, our technicians. And thank you very much for contributing this is, to this successful event. There is going to be an exhibition of Kirsten and other persons in July in Constance, Germany. And the main topic will be clothes, blood, and gold in the schools of the colonial era of Constance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And good Ciao. 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 Ciao.